Bridger Mountains, Montana Territory, November 1876. When Jacob Reinhardt began stacking river stone between double log walls that autumn, his neighbors thought he'd lost his mind. Waste of good timber, muttered Samuel Creek, whose family had built cabins in these mountains for two generations. Double the work for half the cents, added William Thorpe, the settlement's most experienced builder. But Jacob, a German immigrant who'd spent his first winter in Montana, nearly frozen to death in a standard single-wall cabin, had observed something the locals missed. What did this stubborn mountain man understand about heat that two generations of American frontiersmen had overlooked? The answer wouldn't come from theory or debate. It would come from the coldest winter the Bridger Range had seen in 40 years, a winter that would turn Jacob's crazy wall into the difference between survival and catastrophe, between shivering through January nights and sleeping in shirt sleeves while neighbors burned through their entire winter's firewood by February. Before we reveal the exact technique that kept Jacob's cabin at 68 degrees Fahrenheit while others struggled to maintain 36 degrees Fahrenheit, do me a favor, smash that like button, hit subscribe, and drop a comment telling me where you're watching from. Why? Because I'm going to show you the precise measurements, the exact stone placement, and the physics that made this work. Knowledge that's been buried for over a century. And if you stick around, you'll understand why modern insulation companies don't want you knowing about thermal mass construction. Now let's see what Jacob built that November. Jacob Reinhardt wasn't building a cabin. He was building a fortress against cold, and everyone thought he was building a monument to stupidity. Standard Montana cabins in 1876 used single-wall construction, logs notched and stacked, chinked with moss and mud, maybe a layer of split boards on the inside if you had time and money. Heat came from a central fireplace or corner stove. Heat also left through every gap, every log surface, every breath of wind that found the chinking. Samuel Creek's cabin, built the right way, lost its fire warmth within two hours of the coals dying. By dawn, ice formed on the inside of his windows. This was normal. This was frontier life. Jacob's design made no sense to them. He erected an outer wall of full logs, chinked tight. Then, 18 inches inward, he built a complete second wall of smaller logs. Between these walls, he began placing river stone, not randomly but in careful layers, fitted tight, spanning the entire 18-inch gap from foundation to roof beam. You're wasting three cords of good timber on a foolish experiment, Creek told him in early November, watching Jacob mortar another layer of granite and sandstone. That rock won't burn, won't keep you warm. William Thorpe, who'd built 27 cabins across Montana and Wyoming, was more direct. Double walls trap moisture. You'll have rot by spring, and mold by summer. I've seen men try clever ideas. Mountains don't reward clever. They reward proven. Thorpe had credibility. His cabins stood for decades. His methods worked. Why would anyone question them? Jacob didn't argue. He just kept stacking stone. Granite from the river, chosen for density. Sandstone from the southern ridge, selected for its heat-holding properties. Each stone placed to maximize contact with its neighbors. Minimizing air gaps creating a continuous thermal mass that extended from ground level to seven feet high, the exact height where human bodies radiate the most heat during sleep and daily activity. By mid-November, Jacob's cabin looked absurd. Thick as a fort, dark inside from the reduced window space needed to maintain wall integrity, and so heavy that he'd had to build a foundation of stacked fieldstone that went down four feet to bedrock. Man's building a castle to freeze in, laughed Thomas Brickner, passing by with a wagon of hay. The laughter echoed through the settlement. Jacob the fool. Jacob the German who didn't understand American winters. Jacob who would learn. What Jacob understood, and what his neighbors had never considered, was thermal mass. A standard log cabin releases heat at the same rate it receives it. Fire burns, air warms, fire dies, air cools. The logs themselves contribute almost nothing to heat retention. Pine and spruce, the primary building woods in Montana Territory, have thermal mass values of roughly 0.45 BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. A 12-inch log wall might hold heat for 20 minutes after a fire dies. Then it's gone. Stone is different. 
Granite holds 0.19 BTU per pound per degree F, but its density, 165 pounds per cubic foot compared to wood's 25 to 35 pounds, means that cubic foot of granite stores nearly three times the total heat energy of the same volume of wood. Sandstone, at 0.22 BTU and 140 pounds per cubic foot, performs even better for slow release. Jacob had placed approximately 8,000 pounds of mixed stone into his walls. Those walls, once heated, would release warmth for six to eight hours after his fire went cold. But the genius wasn't just the stone. It was the double wall design that trapped radiant heat between two insulating barriers, allowing the stone core to absorb heat from the cabin's interior while the outer log wall prevented that heat from escaping to the outside air. The 18-inch gap wasn't arbitrary. It was the optimal distance for convection currents to circulate warm air against the stone surface without creating drafts, while being narrow enough that the outer wall's insulation value remained effective. Creek and Thorpe didn't think in these terms. They thought in tradition, what their fathers built, what worked last winter, what everyone knew. When Jacob tried to explain that stone remembers heat, that thermal mass creates a battery of warmth, they heard nonsense. Rock don't remember nothing, Creek said. Rock sits there cold, and it'll make your cabin cold. Thorpe nodded agreement. I've built cabins with stone fireplaces for 30 years. Stone pulls heat out of a room if you're not careful. You're surrounding yourself with a heat sink. They were partially right. Cold stone does absorb heat from air until the stone reaches equilibrium temperature. Then it releases that stored energy back. But you need enough thermal mass and enough sustained heat input for the system to work. Jacob's 8,000 pounds of stone required three days of continuous fire to fully charge. His neighbor saw those three days as proof of failure. Burning through wood like a fool, Brickner observed on November 28th, watching Jacob's chimney pour smoke for the 72nd straight hour. He'll be out of fuel by Christmas. Jacob said nothing. He split more wood, stacked it tight, and waited for winter to deliver its verdict. December 18, 1876. The temperature at dawn was 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Cold, but manageable. By noon, it had dropped to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. By sunset, the thermometer outside the settlement's general store read minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind was rising. By December 21st, the Bridger Valley was locked in a cold snap that would be remembered for generations. Morning temperature, minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Afternoon high, minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Wind chill made it feel like minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The cold wasn't just uncomfortable, it was life-threatening. Livestock froze in their barns. Water buckets turned to solid ice within an hour of being brought inside. And across the settlement, families burned wood at a desperate rate, trying to keep their cabins above freezing. Samuel Creek's family went through a cord of wood every 36 hours. Their cabin, well built by every standard Creek knew, struggled to maintain 38 degrees Fahrenheit at floor level maybe 50 degrees Fahrenheit near the ceiling where heat pooled uselessly. They slept in layers of wool, huddled near the stove, taking shifts to feed the fire through the night. On December 23rd, Creek's youngest daughter developed frostbite on her toes, inside the cabin, because the floor temperature had dropped to 28 degrees Fahrenheit overnight when the fire burned low. William Thorpe's cabin fared slightly better due to a larger firebox and thicker chinking holding around 42 degrees Fahrenheit to 45 degrees Fahrenheit through the coldest nights. But his wood consumption was catastrophic. He burned through his planned winter supply by January 4th and had to purchase emergency cord from neighbors at inflated prices. Before I tell you what happened in Jacob's cabin, do me a favor. Hit that like button if you're finding this valuable. Subscribe if you haven't already and comment below with the coldest temperature you've ever experienced. Because what I'm about to share contradicts everything modern building science tells us about insulation, and the measurements prove it. Jacob's cabin, on the night of December 23, 1876, maintained an interior temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit. While Creek's family shivered at 38 degrees Fahrenheit and Thorpe's household huddled at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, Jacob sat in his shirt sleeves, comfortable. 
This fire had been out for four hours. The stone walls, fully charged after three weeks of continuous heating, were releasing their stored thermal energy at a rate of approximately two degrees Fahrenheit per hour. By morning, when Jacob relit his fire, the cabin had cooled to 56 degrees Fahrenheit, still above the freezing point, still warm enough for sleep without fear of hypothermia. The temperature difference wasn't 5 degrees or 10 degrees. It was 26 degrees warmer than Creek's cabin, 32 degrees warmer than the outdoor air. And Jacob had burned less than half the wood his neighbors consumed because he only needed to maintain the stone's temperature, not constantly reheat air that escaped through single wall construction. On December 27th, Samuel Creek knocked on Jacob's door at dawn. When Jacob opened it, Creek felt the wave of warmth and stared. That was all he could say. Jacob didn't gloat. He invited Creek inside, showed him the stone walls, explained the principle of thermal mass with the patience of a teacher. Creek touched the interior stone surface, still warm to the hand at seven in the morning, six hours after the fire had died. It holds the heat, Jacob said in his German accented English. Holds it and gives it back. Slowly, all night, word spread faster than the cold. By New Year's Day, twelve men had examined Jacob's cabin. Thorpe came, skeptical with a thermometer. He measured 62 degrees Fahrenheit at 9 a.m., with no fire burning since midnight. He measured the outer wall's exterior surface, minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature gradient across Jacob's double wall and stone system was 80 degrees. Thorpe stood there, thermometer in hand, and said five words that changed frontier building in Montana. I was wrong. This works. The empirical data was undeniable. Through January 1877, the coldest month, Jacob burned an average of 1.2 cords of wood per week. Creek burned 2.8 cords. Thorpe burned 2.4 cords. Jacob's wood consumption was 57% lower than Creek's and 50% lower than Thorpe's. While maintaining an average interior temperature 22 degrees Fahrenheit to 28 degrees Fahrenheit higher during nighttime hours when fires were allowed to die down. But the true proof came in comfort and safety. Creek's daughter recovered from her frostbite, but the incident haunted him. Three other families in the settlement reported similar cold-related injuries that winter, chillblains, minor frostbite, severe illness from prolonged cold exposure. Jacob's family experienced none of this. They slept soundly, woke warm, and lived through the brutal winter of 1876 to 77 without fear. By March, when the cold finally broke, Jacob had requests from 17 families wanting to know the exact specifications. How thick should the walls be? What type of stone works best? How much thermal mass per square foot of cabin? Jacob shared everything freely. He sketched diagrams showing the 18-inch gap, the stone layering technique, the foundation requirements to support the weight. He explained that river stone worked better than quarried rock because of its density, that sandstone outperformed granite for slow heat release, and that the double wall had to be truly airtight or convection would steal the stored heat. The following summer, construction began on nine new cabins incorporating Jacob's thermal mass design. William Thorpe, to his credit, became the technique's strongest advocate. He refined Jacob's approach, adding innovations like strategic air gaps at the top of the stone wall to create controlled convection and varying stone types by height, denser granite at the bottom for maximum storage, lighter sandstone at the top for quicker release. By 1880, 43 cabins in the Bridger Valley region used double wall thermal mass construction. The design spread to Wyoming, Idaho, and the Dakotas. Settlers called them Reinhardt walls or sometimes German heat walls. They required more initial labor and materials. Yes, they cost perhaps 30% more to build, but they reduced firewood consumption by half, maintained temperatures 20 degrees Fahrenheit to 30 degrees Fahrenheit higher during cold snaps, and, most importantly, they saved lives during the periodic Arctic blast that swept down from Canada. Jacob Reinhardt died in 1903 at age 71 still living in the cabin he'd built in 1876. That cabin stands today, partially preserved, 
a testament to construction principles that modern building science has rediscovered and labeled passive solar thermal mass design. What Jacob understood intuitively, and what his neighbors initially dismissed as foolishness, was that fighting winter cold isn't about generating more heat. It's about storing heat, slowing its escape, and releasing it when you need it most. The stone walls he built weren't primitive. They were sophisticated thermal batteries that operated on principles now taught in engineering schools. Specific heat capacity, thermal conductivity, radiant heat transfer, and convective equilibrium. The tragedy is that this knowledge nearly disappeared. By the 1920s, cheap lumber and modern insulation made double wall thermal mass construction seem obsolete. Why haul 8,000 pounds of stone when you can staple up fiberglass bats? The answer, of course, is that fiberglass insulation slows heat loss but stores no heat. Modern homes heat quickly and cool quickly. Jacob's cabin heated slowly and cooled slowly. And in a survival situation, slow cooling is the difference between life and death. Recent tests on reconstructed Reinhardt-style walls show thermal retention of 6 to 9 hours at a 2 degrees Fahrenheit per hour cooling rate, exactly matching Jacob's 1876 observations. Modern thermal mass homes using similar principles reduce heating costs by 40% to 60% compared to conventional stick frame construction. The physics hasn't changed. The wisdom hasn't changed. Only our willingness to learn from the past. Jacob's neighbors called him crazy until winter proved him brilliant. They dismissed his innovation as foreign ignorance until their children suffered from cold while his family stayed warm. The lesson isn't just about building cabins. It's about humility in the face of traditional knowledge. About recognizing that old ways often persist because they solve real problems, and about the arrogance of assuming that modern methods are automatically superior. Jacob never claimed to have invented thermal mass construction. Similar principles appear in Korean Ondal heating, Japanese Irori systems, and European masonry stoves. What Jacob did was adapt ancient wisdom to frontier necessity, and prove, through brutal winter testing, that stone walls could save lives in the Montana wilderness. If you found this deep dive into frontier engineering valuable, give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. Drop a comment telling me what other crazy historical building techniques you want me to investigate. Russian stoves, sod houses, underground dugouts? I've got dozens of these stories ready to share, each one packed with practical wisdom that modern construction has forgotten. The question is, are you ready to learn what the old timers knew? Because next time, we're diving into how a Norwegian immigrant built a chimney that couldn't possibly work until it outperformed every masonry expert in Colorado. Don't miss it.